How you all doing? You can clap at the end. You can clap at the end. All right, is the, uh, is the mic on? All right, well, I've said heck with PowerPoints. This is my eighth talk in the past four weeks, um, so I've given up on PowerPoints. But I want to say that this is going to be exciting um, because on the way here, while writing this lecture, I came up with something new that I'm going to share with you for the first time if this podium doesn't fall over. So basically, to start off, I want to tell you a story. And this story is about a group of people with incredible technological capability and unique, heretofore, never-before-seen powers, who jet-set around the world fighting war and injustice. And they face the threat of regulation and registration from some of the same people they seek to protect. Who am I talking about? Am I talking about the Avengers? Am I talking about Captain America Civil War? Who am I talking about? I'm talking about us. I'm talking about the social innovation sector, particularly those who use information communication technologies in humanitarian response, human rights, and development. Since the dawn of the Ushahidi crowd mapping platform during the Kenyan election violence in 2007, 2008, we've entered what I like to call the 1950s world of tomorrow, an age of euphoria and utopia about what the integration of smartphones, social media, unmanned aerial vehicles, satellites can mean during disasters, during development, during human rights crises. And now we're beginning to enter what I want to call the dissonance phase, basically the first 15 minutes of every Bill Murray film. Whether it's Ghostbusters, Stripes, starts off really excited. Something happens, okay? Don't leave, the plants are gonna die, right? The line from Stripes. Ghostbusters, they get kicked out of Columbia. So basically, we're in the Bill Murray cycle. <laughs> the excitement that marked the initial phase of ICT for good, etc., has now turned to what I call dissonance. We are basically, hope gives way to reality. And with reality, fears of dystopia blow back unintended consequences. And I think that this is the new thing, wait for it, that I came up with on the train this morning. There is throughout history, and this is the point I want to make, repeating all the time is a cycle by which societies integrate innovations into what we call normal. And we don't really understand this cycle too much. And it's probably the same with fire as it is for the smartphone. And basically, this cycle starts with phase one, which is initial, initial adoption based on potential. Hey, thag, yes, we have fire. <laughs> What can we do with fire? But then we go to phase two, which is the friction phase. Hey, don't be using the fire in the cave. <laughs> don't use the fire on me phase. And with friction, you have, in the friction phase, you have this interplay of friction and adaption, right? Okay, well, if I use the fire <laughs> outside the cave, thag's not on fire. <laughs> But we, the fire goes out. So we begin to develop things like ovens, <laughs> like fire pits. So as we enter friction and adaption, something else begins to happen. And what happens after that is adaption eventually leads to negotiation, where society negotiates with the value proposition and the risk proposition around a technology and begins to create a compact. Right? We started with planes before we had the FAA, cars before we had seatbelts, right? As Simon Bolivar said famously, um, all good judgment comes from experience and all experience comes from bad judgment. Basically, this negotiation is occurring often throughout the integration cycle of an innovation. And you can have a compact in some cases that precedes initial adoption. 
sometimes friction, can show up unexpectedly in the midst of a well-established compact. One only needs to look at nuclear energy, <laughs> the Betamax, <laughs> VCR, um, the list goes on. The cycle is occurring always, simultaneously, sometime out of order. And to repeat, initial adoption, friction and adaption, negotiation to a compact, and then integration or acceptance. And basically, when you look at integration of innova innovation occurring, it really is about three things being established. Limitations. You can't drive your car outside the lines, right? Limitations. The car can't go in the water. We begin to accept both what it can't do technically and what it shouldn't do socially. That leads to a set of standards and regulations. Standards is your car has to have these things to meet the limitations. And regulations is how we're going to enforce those standards being on your car. So this is all a long-winded way of saying, in terms of our use of information communication technologies, we have inverted this cycle. We are not doing it intentionally. And that's a big problem, and I'm going to tell you why in a second. But how, with human rights groups and humanitarians using information communication technologies, did we get to the equivalent of an F-15 tabletop spin, when a fighter jet goes out of trajectory and its engines are going, but it's spinning as it declines? We're basically in that entropic point now. How did we get here? We got here because we encoded into our use of crisis maps and crowd maps, we encoded into them not only ones and zeros, but assumptions and aspirations. Some of the assumptions, technology democratizes things. Technology, ICTs, social media protects things. ICTs, smartphone, social media, elevates people economically, right? We've encoded these as social software into how and why we've deployed these technologies. Well, what are we learning? In a paper, my colleagues and I at the Signal Program on Human Security and Technology at Harvard Humanitarian Initiative published last month with the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Assistance um, and our colleagues at NYU and University of Leiden, we found that basically we don't have a framework for data responsibility. We don't have an intentional way of what we need to know to do before we deploy. The second thing we found in a paper coming out with the United Nations with our colleagues at OCHA at the end of this month is we're finding that our use of information communication technologies is actually causing disasters. <laughs> not only do we not know what the evidence is of the good yet, we don't have a science for that, we're causing four types of data disasters. They are data deluge. We're producing large amounts of data without knowing what's actionable to the point where response operations are slowed by the amount of data that's supposedly to help us. Boston Marathon bombing, our colleagues at Syracuse University looked at the supposed social media um, explosion that helped responders and found that only 238 of the several hundred thousand tweets, which are equal to three to five libraries of Congresses stacked on top of each other of social media data. From the first few hours, only 200 plus had a location. It took the FBI three and a half weeks to go through that. So we're causing a variety of different types of complications because we don't understand what we need it to do and what it actually does. So why did our assumptions and our aspirations not work out. It's because our ethical antecedents, and there's no way to make a crowd happy like using the word antecedent or analog, our ethical standards that we had from the 20th century were about individual privacy and about personal identifiable information. But we are generating a type of data with these technologies that we don't even have a name for. In a book chapter I have coming out in a couple months, I attempt to name it. It's demographically identifiable information. It's no longer about individuals, it's about communities and populations. Sometimes communities and populations that don't even know they're being viewed 
by someone using the data as a population or a community. So basically now <laughs> we have streams of data we don't have a name for that our old ethics about individual consent and personal privacy, you can follow those and still kill people with this data. <laughs> So there's two big concepts here, and how am I doing on time? Good. All right, two big concepts. A colleague, Eve de Montjoy at MIT, looked at credit card data, and he found that privacy or anonymization as we know it technically doesn't exist anymore. He came up with the theory of unicity, the idea that in large data sets you can begin to track individuals through their patterns in the data set, which are unique. And with unicity, you can begin to identify individuals from large data sets. Meanwhile, down at University of Texas, Austin, they ran it the other way in 2007. And what they did in the Netflix prize study, which you should all read and freak out about, is they took 500,000 Netflix prize winner records that were available publicly and created an algorithm based on having some personal information about an individual to find them in the cloud of data. And they could, the majority of the time. They could figure out who the individual was based on Netflix choices. So where we are now is we're in the age of, they call that eccentricity. So that eccentricity and unicity <laughs> can be exploited and extrapolated to populations. And in many cases, what we're trying to do in disasters is to do that for good. But we're not the only ones who are doing it. <laughs> so where we are now is we are at a critical pivot point. The issues I'm raising today are basically the fundamental human rights issues that will determine the future of human freedom in the 21st and 22nd century, and I am not kidding. How we figure out the ethical standards and the way we create social compact about the use of demographically identifiable data will determine things like warrants, will determine things like protecting people in their infectious disease status, protecting vulnerable populations. And now, 48 hours after Orlando, after that tragedy, this issue has, could never be more important. <laughs> In a real life example, a colleague of mine from an unnamed European country with an LGBT organization several years ago responded to a set of attacks by skinheads against gay and lesbian and transgender nightclubs. And they did this by creating a public map of where the attacks were occurring to warn people and to document. Within 24 to 48 hours, the level of attacks against LGBT people in this city went through the roof. The amount of people in the ICU was higher than in all the previous attacks they were trying to prevent. Why? Because they provided the PERP, a higher degree of situational awareness and actionable information, a targeting solution on the very population they were trying to protect. We are doing this all the time. <laughs> our aspirations and our assumptions about what we want the technology to achieve has superseded our science for determining what it actually does, our evidence for what it's actually doing that we want it to do, and our ethics, our data responsibility for initially proceeding how we make decisions about our responsibilities before we try to do a good. So what do we do? This is all pretty depressing, right? Well, it's as depressing as we allow it to be. So for my team at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative at the Single Program, this is what I've decided to do. For the next year, I hereby announce we're not innovating anything. <laughs> we are full stopping on innovation. I told my team I don't want to see new tech I don't want to see new partnerships. I don't want to see a new whiz-bang prototype near my face at all. I only want to see two things. I want to see evidence based on a survey, based on quantitative data of what these technologies actually do in the field. 
and I want to see minimum technical standards and ethical principles for their use. If you're not giving me that, get out the door. I basically said I want this to be the year where we cut our ACDC Back in Black album of data responsibility ethics. It's got to have a sweet A side. Back in Black, Hell's Bells, You Shook Me All Night Long, Thunderstruck, best album ever. The point is, I, I want us to keep it simple. Four chords, hard, but <laughs> specific to identifying what we are doing in the field with evidence and how we do it ethically. And I invite you to take the no innovation challenge within your organizations to stop. The most radical thing you can do is say, we don't know what it does. <laughs> we don't know how to know we're doing it ethically. Stop, ask for help, work together, create a movement, because if we don't, no one else will. Thank you. So questions? All right, great, thanks, see you. <laughs> Thanks, Nathaniel. I'm not quite sure where to start. The, um, I guess one of, one of the um, questions I have is, uh, are there any analogies, analogies for this? Has it, ha, do you, are you learning from other experiences in technological his, history that is, say, beyond fire and the caveman, but more um, related to the kind of decentralized and distributed phenomena that we're seeing now, as opposed to the centralized industrial phenomena that a lot of our technology, technological progress has been defined by? That, that's a great question. Um, we're, see, we're seeing parts of it, and we don't know how it fits together. I, I think what's, I, I gave a talk at the Humanitarian Technology Conference last week, which was also here in Boston. And it just turned out, ironically, that where the conference was being held was on the exact GPS location of the November 28th, 1942 Coconut Grove fire. Who here knows what the 1942 Coconut Grove fire is? You're all a bunch of kids, jeepers, no. Um, <laughs> sound like a cr cranky old man. The 1942 Coconut Grove fire was the most transformative moment in the history of emergency medicine and humanitarian medicine innovation ever. And we talk about this innovation moment like we just discovered innovation. No, in 1942, first year of American involvement in World War II, giant fire breaks down the largest nightclub in Boston. A thousand people were in a room with a capacity of about 420. It was the night of the Boston College Holy Cross football game qualifying for the Sugar Bowl. Boston College lost, Holy Cross won. Boston College party at the Coconut Grove is canceled. Holy Cross goes there instead. A busboy, and I'll get, we're getting there. So a busboy <laughs> making out with his girlfriend allegedly takes the light bulb out to hide them in the back room <laughs> while they're kissing, puts it back in and lights a match to make sure it's in and it catches the decorations of the coconut fronds and the whole building goes up. It went so fast, that the people sitting at their tables when the firefighters got in there were holding cocktail glasses and they were charred. <laughs> they died where they sat. <laughs> so what came out of that? Well, that night, Francis Hines Moore and Oliver Cope happened to be on night duty at Mass General Hospital. They were experimenting with two things. One, fluid resuscitation, and the other was the tannic or petroleum aqueous bandage. Those who went to MGH survived 100%. Those who went to Boston City, 30% survival rate. Out of that fluid resuscitation, you know what that's called? IV bags. <laughs> Penicillin, first tested on the survivors. The theory of PTSD, Eric Lindemann, came out of the Coconut Grove fire. Modern fire sign exits and panic bars. Coconut Grove. <laughs> so how did that happen? Look at that innovation, incredible innovation. One incident, the single largest building death prior to 9-11. Why was it a moment of innovation we can learn from? It was bounded by law, regulation, and medical ethics. Every single Ushahidi-like Kenyan 
election violence innovation they had, then went into a process of medical review and evidence check with an ethical framework. They did it with a relationship to the experimental subject in a context of laws. Right now, we're doing the same thing, but we're doing it in a blind spot. So the antecedent here is from Coconut Grove. We have Coconut Groves happening all the time. The question is the jurisdictional mandate of ethics and law that's going to allow it to do it. The joke I make all the time, the stuff we do in Africa might win you Nobel Peace Prize. Do in the United States, you might get arrested by the FDA. Any other questions? Hello. So I had a question. Earlier you were mentioning about like, protecting individual privacy and identifiable information, but still being able to gather demographic information. So my interest is kind of in mobile health and using like, geolocations while trying to maintain some sort of anonymity if you're collecting health data. How would you find, what's a good method of trying to keep it ethical, but at the same time get useful information that you can use demographically to, you know, find areas to be of assistance or... Well, let's, that's a big question. So what you're dealing with is TSMD, temporal spatial metadata. And in TSMD, it is, that is, in the professional standards for protection work of the Red Cross, it's actually considered less important than anecdotal individually collected data. And I think that's really wrong. <laughs> Temporal spatial metadata is the harm vector in the attack model of the 21st century. It, it just, it is. And so at the heart of that is how do you get consent with two problems, right? One is you're dealing with populations and you probably can't even originally identify who the individuals are. Two, even if you could, how do you manage that consent process in an ethical way? Well, the answer is you can't. Okay, and then, there's, and then there's a third issue. You don't fully understand what it does. So how do you ask, you are suddenly out in Sudan, <laughs> in Darfur, and you are telling the goat herd <laughs> what you're doing with, for informed consent with data that you don't even have informed consent because you don't know its permutations. So the issue is this. It's about getting a red button and a bright line. The red button is if you can't answer certain harm questions, don't do it. You're experimenting sometimes on the most vulnerable people in the world at the worst moment in their life, and you're trying to see if you, there's a pony in there somewhere. Don't. Just say no. <laughs> Okay, and, I, and I'm not throwing a stone in a glass house. I was the director of operations for George Clooney's Satellite Sentinel Project, using spy-grade satellite over Sudan to track troops, to track mass graves. It was the largest single deployment of civil society with satellites ever attempted. The fact of the matter is, is that um, we had to say stop. We actually didn't know what we were doing. So the first thing is a red button. Bright lines, go to the OCHA report, um, that we did on data responsibility last month. There's four pieces in, in terms of the bright lines. Realize you're in an ecosystem. Your protection of a population from a DII threat is only as good as everyone else. <laughs> so that's what's so different about this new ethical environment, is that you can be doing everything on your checklist right. You can do your code of conduct and still kill people, right? So realize you're in an ecosystem. Feedback loops. If the people whose data colleague said something the other day when we were in the Netherlands, blew my mind. Data is people. Tattoo it on your arm. Data is people. <laughs> Say it with me. Amen. Yeah. Okay, so if you can't treat data as people, then it's time to stop. If you can, then you've got to have the people whose data it is deciding the process. Any other questions? We've got time for one more. Just to say that I appreciated your last uh, point that you made. I work for the United Nations World Food Program, um, and we have a vulnerability analysis and mapping division that um, as exploring also uh, collaboration with the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative 
Um, we are doing that partnership, so I am yes, your partner. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I think it's it's also extremely timely that we're looking at this as as population vulnerable populations expand and grow, um, and and disasters become much worse. I'm just wondering, are there any sort of indicators or algorithms that you think? Um, could expand and grow um, in in the sense that you know you have a forthcoming um, you know food shortage happening because of various climate change uh, impacts um, and of course civil conflict is is always there. Um, what are your thoughts on this? So um, we made one of the first humanitarian satellite imagery algorithms. It's called Tuchel Detector. It was recently uh, mentioned in the New Yorker. Um, and Tuchel Detector, it basically, I can go into the technical aspects of it, but you can see a talk I gave on it online, but we're trying to detect arson through the destruction of traditional huts called Tuchels. Now, what was mind-blowing about the Tuchel Detector innovation process as it relates to ethics and algorithms is that basically we don't have a playbook for taking things that we don't know how to do manually <laughs> and then ethically putting it on steroids at high speed. But some lessons we did learn from Tuchel Detector as it relates to algorithms is that first, start really simple because simple is very complex. So begin with the binary, um, yes or no's. Second is that if you can't 